everyone, it's Alex, and today I'm here to do my February wrap-up. I would say overall that February was also a lukewarm reading month like January was, but there were at least a couple of books here that I was really excited to get to, but I just wished I liked them more. And if you may have not noticed, if you're subscribed to me and I may have been bombarding your subscription feed, with this month, I did a read-along for three of Elena Ferrante's novellas and one of her nonfiction works. Of those books, I had not read the novella The Lost Daughter or her nonfiction work Incidental Inventions before. These were two books that were great reminders of just Ferrante's sense of writing that I think really displays this sense of immediacy about women who just urge themselves to get what they want, but like in a meaningful way toward their outlook in life. But they're also so vigilant in being realistic on kind of their own personhood as a symbol of the history in their lives, with recurring themes of relationships between how women are defined as wives, daughters, and mothers. Particularly The Lost Daughter was, I think, probably my favorite of the month just because I felt like it had a refreshingly refined sense of voice. Because I think it managed to express disdain, but not to like the point of exhaustion that I'm used to with Ferrante, but in a good way. Instead, I think Ferrante was able to put a spotlight on themes like guilt and shame, which I'm not entirely used to with her books but of course it was just something else that she managed to craft so well. Meanwhile with Incidental Inventions I thought it was a great sort of little collection because the entries are really so small and brief that you don't really get a true feel for Ferrante so I wouldn't recommend it if you've never read her before but that book is really just full of these little slice of life commentaries on different subjects and I think it really helps humanize this iconic figure that Ferrante is mainly because of her like notoriety between her anonymity. But if you're curious, I for this month I just did a bunch of reading vlogs each week for each book. Um, tomorrow's reading vlog will be up tomorrow um, and that one should be interesting but if you followed me along this month for the Fronte February read-along I hope you read something by her that you found rewarding or maybe even enjoyable and it was really fun more fun than I thought it would be to do like a vlog format so I had a really good time and I hope you did too. This month I also read Kazuo Ishiguro's new book coming out next week and it is Clara and the Sun. I did a separate review of this on my channel so you're welcome to go check that out for my full thoughts but in summary this book is really just about this AI named Clara that eventually goes to stay with this family. Clara mainly obsesses over the sun while the family itself has their own preoccupations with keeping them on track what I, with like basically with what I would think is that this book is all about a intersection or a conflict with what happens with personal desires. I was surprised how well Ishiguro was able to craft a story about technology without it really feeling like it was projecting onto the theme of codependency that technology may have on people. But that being said, I did find the story to be a bit bumpy along the way in trying to execute its themes that kind of feel like they all try to boil up to something that doesn't really pay off entirely for me in a satisfying way. A conflict being a very plotty element to the story that I felt like was focused on well enough but seems to clash with Clara's own journey that feels much more fueled by symbolism. I myself found the first half of this book more interesting because it really does seep into kind of showing what this not too far dystopia we're looking at could really be a reflection of it's something that we might experience in our lifetime. Really crafting this sense of existential dread that really bleeds into you as a reader and kind of shaping or wondering about do you relate more to Clara as an AI or to this family who are actually people. But overall, like I said, this book did leave me a bit underwhelmed, but I do think it'll be a hot book whenever it comes out just because I feel like people could read it a bunch of different ways. All right, so now getting into the books I haven't talked about on my channel yet, it is Black History Month this month for February, so I wanted to make sure that I read a Black author, but also I just wanted to set a personal rule for myself trying to read one contemporary or new release and then one backlisted title. And so that new release that I want to talk about first is Black Buck by Matteo Ascaripor. This novel follows a man named Darren as he's in his early 20s. He's working at a Starbucks and he's approached by this man to come work at a startup. Darren quickly learns that startup culture, to him at least, is based on an absence and opportunity for race being that all of his co-workers are white. And with Darren being a black male, Darren's boss, who is white, perhaps sees a lot of potential in Darren to work in sales, 
based on Darren's perceptiveness of perhaps a space of privilege he's never known before. At least that's what I tried to salvage from this book because really its thematic quality is still a little lost on me even whenever I got to the end. Because the book does market itself as a satire, but the longer I kept going with the book, the more crazier it got with the plot, with the stakes going higher, but at the same time feeling serious, so away from being a satire, but not serious enough for the plot to really make sense, which might be telling of a story that's about a rise to power, but if it was going to be about that, I wish it didn't also have to be about this dazzling life of luxury because I felt like the author wasn't able to express exactly how those two things shared a space together. And I think the way that Ascarapore tries to bring it all together is with these really off-the-wall, offbeat punchlines or jokes that feel very reminiscent of like humor from maybe like five years ago. And the reason this book is called Black Buck is because Darren, being a black man and he works at Starbucks, Bucks is just his nickname. So I thought there would be a lot more focus on microaggressions maybe in the workplace or whatever else, but the novel doesn't really give itself enough time to be patient with trying to craft those kinds of more clever or more researched or more investigative stories. Although what is apparent is that I think this book is especially enjoyable as it was for me, even though it kind of lost me a bit, for people of color or a black audience perhaps because the book does take this format of the rhetoric of a user manual. As Buck tries to give us this sales pitch of what it's like to interact with white people, which I guess is where the satire comes from, but I found this really unbelievable as soon as I realized there was a time skip. The time skips really took me out of pretty much everything because I don't know how the user manual is supposed to work based on having that, but I think it was a way to accommodate like a much more like unrealistic sense of Darren's rise to power because it would be too much with everything going on in the plot to try to explain it in a linear sense of real time. Which is a shame because in a way I think this book gets distracted by feeling like it has to have these little subplots that end up just getting resolved by the next chapter anyway. Ultimately I feel like this book just really lacked focus or consistency but that being said I did find it entertaining to read as one of the most enjoyable reads I've read in like the past few years. So while I think this book is structurally fragile and a bit shaky with what it's trying to say I did enjoy it so I think it was like a nice book to kind of shut my brain off and just pick up whenever I just felt like reading in general. Up next for my backlisted um, title that I wanted to read for this month, it is Lot by Brian Washington. This was Washington's short story collection that I feel really put him on the map before the buzziness of his novel Memorial. Both Memorial and Lot have similarities in exploring characters that have this existential angst about sort of the restrictions and limitations towards their opportunities. But to me, Lot was way more effective in Washington able to craft these like recurring scenes that are so vivid. Using Houston, Texas as a backdrop for all of these stories where it gives characters this sense of kinship but also kind of shows their contrast and what they think are their unique struggles. While these stories at times do sound like they're a bit familiar or like each other, I think it's less due to a lack of imagination, but more about emphasizing a possessiveness about really claiming and owning where you come from and how that shapes you. Almost all characters from Lot are from POC communities, so it's always like in the contrast of this imagined dreamscape of reality that's often reserved for white people. And Washington uses this to help jumpstart his characters into really discovering this dwelling of some intimate experiences that they reflect on to help kind of bridge the gap between their desires being something that requires focus to accomplish, whether that being race or sexuality as examples. And Washington does not spare you at the end of a story of really knowing how gut-punched these characters feel that they try so hard to not show. I especially think that the first story in this collection, while very slim and short, I think is a great tone setter for the collection and kind of works as a premonition of sorts, showing what stories are yet to come with characters that are demanding your attention while competing against Washington's expertly crafted use of setting. So while I thought Memorial by Washington was fine, I really loved Lot, so if you had to pick one by him, I would start here. Up next, I wanted to talk about one of my 2021 new releases that I was really looking forward to, and that is Let Me Tell You What I Mean by Joan Didion. This is a newly packaged book of essays by Didion that I believe range from 1960s to early 2000s, ranging from familiar Didion interests like thoughts on writing and even her own writing 
writing or also some iconic figures like Hemingway and Nancy Reagan as examples. To me, reading Didion is less of a personal investment on the subject matter, but just seeing her process of writing through like practically an ethnographic lens. Much of these essays take up space with some citations or quotations that really show evidence of Didion's own personal use of what remains in her memory about these people or these thoughts. But unfortunately, where the essays are so brief in here and you can really swallow them in one gulp, I think it sort of loses a bit of staying power with these essays feeling more like introductions to a longer essay. Meanwhile, that same briefness I think is more effective in Didion's more personal musings in here, like her thoughts on getting rejected from Stanford, and also just about her own writing as she examines her own novels. Changing the tone of what initially might feel like a cutoff from the complete picture of something, to instead feeling like a generosity of randomly, like how we might humanly remember something embarrassing or unwell from a long time ago, but then upon further reflection you can change the meaning of that as you've matured yourself. And to me this is what Didion's nonfiction has always done to me, sort of like incidentally, not being that it's supposed to be this advice column of sorts, but I read her essays very much like that. However, I would definitely not start with this collection if you've never read Didion's nonfiction before. I would personally start with either The White Album or my favorite, Slouching Towards Bethlehem. As these collections, I think, are more representative of how Didion's forthright observations really have enough room to breathe. And with reading those two collections, I would say is what has made me more contemplative than anything involving contemplation that I felt with Let Me Tell You What I Mean. And the final book I want to talk about today is another 2021 new release I was looking forward to, and that is No One Is Talking About This by Patricia Lockwood. This novel follows an unnamed narrator as she explores thoughts on the imagination and influence of the internet. Our narrator herself finds herself going viral by asking a question about dogs, and so she's eventually flown out and is traveling to all these different panels. And I think what's most effective with this book and what I think is certainly the most interesting thing that it's doing is by creating this sort of sole objective perspective of what the internet in our age or era it really is. When we're living in a time where it's so easy to have this giant spectrum of one day being so viral that you're not really an ordinary person anymore versus now being a feature at talks and really being in front of so many people that only know you based on their own perspective or subjective lens of something that is so unintentional. And our narrator explores this by really her obsession with Twitter, but in the book it's just called The Portal. And the first half of this book is really the narrator taking time to give like these medley of internet phenomena and pop culture references that I think really brands this book to a certain audience maybe someone in their mid to late 20s or their early 30s, which honestly is kind of disorienting to read about because in a way I think it's Lockwood showing like FOMO that if you don't understand a reference how the internet collectively doesn't shame you but it definitely does create this public consciousness of really differentiating between is this pop culture or is this just information that I'm not on the pulse of that I should be? And Lockwood especially does comment on how the world feels like it's going through calamity all the time, but whether or not that's actually happening or it's just because places like the internet or Twitter just happens to be this giant archive of horrible things and general malaise. And Lockwood states, or at least the narrator does, about how there seems to be this giant voicelessness to a space that feels like it's always having something to say. And that idea really does translate into the prose or formatting of this book as it's literally, it feels like I'm reading a series of tweets. So while that pretty much covers the first half of the book, the second half of the book does feel more rooted in plot and something I felt was a nice respite to kind of grasp and our narrator does find out that her sister is going through some complications with her pregnancy. And with me talking about how I felt like Lockwood was trying to portray the internet as sort of this gatekeeping of making it beyond a certain threshold to really dig deep and get to the meaningful stuff, I think that was, with the formatting of this book, kind of symbolic to this gesture. As it's with the second half of the book that I think Lockwood really shines in really flexing her writing skills with some really beautiful moments at times. As our narrator does contemplate about her niece, I think it really does show the blur between some nostalgic connection through human experiences 
and this new age of virtual connection. And I think what really saves this book from feeling dated is that it's not a debate about how useful the internet is because I think that's such an outdated approach now. Instead, I think it's about how easy it is to indulge and forget things that feel like initially they matter, but we can distract ourselves enough to the point of not really thinking about it anymore. As our narrator hopes for the same with these complications with her sister's pregnancy, perhaps being symbolic of how now with the internet, we use it as a form of deflection. So overall, I thought this novel was fine. And you might be wondering, Alex, last month you loved another internet novel, which was Fake Account. But for me, I think with Fake Accounts, I think our narrator there was just a bit more forthright in the type of thoughts that she was musing on. Because I think no one is talking about this is more contemplated about internet ideology versus how it really impacted the narrator that we were exploring with. With the first half of this book especially, I feel like I could have just opened up Twitter and would have had the exact same experience. But I do think this book is just barely clever enough to have a little staying power, but unfortunately I think I'll get the same treatment as the pop culture phenomena that Lockwood describes in the first half of this book, not really leaving an impression overall in the literary landscape as I think it thinks it might be doing in years to come. And that's it. Those were all the books that I read for February. So I think I'm really keeping good pace this year with the books I'm reading. And I think next month, especially, I'm already reading some current stuff right now that I think I'm going to really love whenever I finish them. I would love to hear what you read this month or what you even plan to read for next month. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.